is a nation. Most of us are only aware of one type of nation. That's because of the way in which we are trained to think about a nation. But there are in fact many types of nations, surprisingly. Let's go ahead and look at what the Google definition of a nation is from Oxford Languages. It states it's a noun. Quote, a large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular country or territory. And that's relatively helpful where they state that it's a large body of people. Although I doubt that size really makes a difference, again, with their attempts to insinuate things into the definition. So a juridical person is a non-human legal and legal person that is not a single natural person, but an organization recognized by law as a fictitious person. Notice that recognized by law is left vague. It does not specify which law. Again, it's warping the perception of what law is as though there is only one. There is not only one law. And then if you look up juridic nation, you get the United Nations juridical yearbook like the yearbook that we all have when we graduate from our indoctrination centers, the schools of whatnot. And then you also get the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs, which I would state is the General Council for Juridic Entities. So let's go ahead and look at that, which would of course mean that the United Nations is in fact a United Nations of Juridic Nations and not human nations, as we're all led to believe, through insinuation. I don't believe they ever directly state that. Anyway, uh, according to Wikipedia, the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs is a United Nations office currently administered by Undersecretary General for Legal Affairs and Legal Counsel of the United Nations, Miguel de Serpa Suarez. So they basically just stated what I said, but in attempting to not directly state that, of course because that would be a problem if they directly stated that, and they're aware of that, obviously. And then this is very funny, because this comes from the National Institutes, National Institutes of Health.gov. It's interesting. Institutes, not just National Institutes. I always thought it was National Institute. Anyway, public juridic person is an alternative sponsorship arrangement that allows various church entities to share resources thus strengthening their competitive position. Creating a public juridic person is simple in theory, but can be complicated in practice. And here they're basically telling us that there is such a thing as a juridic public. Ha ha ha. And then, when you look at where from where a juridical person is derived, such as how are they birthed, like a human person is birthed from a mother, and a juridical person, I suppose, is birth from a birthing person because they don't, technically speaking, have any mothers or parents. Well, I suppose they have parent companies. Ugh, stuff's stupid. In sum, we can conclude that the legal entity can be defined as follows. A juridical person is an abstract subject created under law and having free will. They have free will. Isn't that nice? Rights, obligations, and legal personhood. Hood which give it a separate identity within legal relationships and make it, make it a gener generator of economic, financial, blah, blah, blah. So there you go. That's where they're derived from. Nowhere, apparently. And then if you look up who represents juridic persons, well, good luck with that one. But it does instantly take you to the Holy See. Well, this is about the second hit on uh, Google where it states that representing a public juridic person and acting in its name are those whose competence is acknowledged by universal or particular law or by its own statutes, basically meaning that a juridic person can represent another juridic person. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Anyway, legal fiction is an assumption and acceptance of something as fact by a court, although it may not be so as to allow a rule to operate or be applied in a manner that differs from its original purpose while leaving the letter of the law 
unchanged. That right there explains exactly what the purpose of lawyers is and attorneys. The overarching idea in fiction theory is that the relationships between the imaginary worlds of fiction and the actual world in which we live are complicated and that one ought not dismiss fiction as simply stories that are not true. Also known as quote unquote conspiracy theory. <laughs> this of course is coming from the lawyers, the uh, legitimate authorities for the people that would in fact charge another with raising conspiracy theories. So go figure. Now, when we look at what an oath is, this comes from Cornell, states this oath usually includes raising a person's hand and promising that the person will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, everybody knows that one. Some documents need to be sworn in, on oath, such as affidavits or declarations. Uh, an affidavit is declaration uh, so, uh, of, a, of a sense. So, I don't know what you call that, but it's a really screwy way to say that. If you require a document sworn, the same can only be done so by a solicitor, commissioner for oaths, or, or alternatively, a court official. Now, notice that's in caps. Well, the first letters of court and official are capitalized. Authorized to administer oaths. Now, notice they put authorized in vague terms. They don't say whom or who is authorizing them, or who or whom, or whatever. Now, if you look up, uh, well, never mind. Uh, types of sworn law enforcement. Sworn law enforcement officers, this is according to Discover Policy and Policing.org, sworn law enforcement officers are those who have taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, their state, and the laws of their blah, blah, blah. So then, therefore... Let's go ahead and look at the Article 6 under the U.S. Constitution. Specifically, in the third paragraph, it states that the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers notice that word there all all officers both of you the united states and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this constitution but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So that means you don't have to swear on the Bible. And people that require swearing on the Bible are directly in violation of this clause in the Constitution. But it also means that all, again, got to reiterate that one about as many times as possible because it seems to be ignored constantly, all executive and judicial officers, not some not a few and not whoever feels like they need to be and not particular offices and none of that. It states all, not some. Then we'll go to the enlisted oath for the Marine Corps. It states, I state your name, do solemnly swear or affirm. Notice that's pulling out from that clause where it states to support or uh, uh, oath or affirmation that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That is actually an oath swearing to operate domestically. So what exactly is domestic? That would be an interesting word to look into. I'm sure they've lied about that one too. Anyway, continuation. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, meaning the Constitution, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. Now, when I swore it, I remember swearing to uphold and defend, not support and defend, so they clearly changed that one. And then also that little addition to the oath of regulations, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, 
if you're swearing to uphold, but what well, honestly doesn't matter because they didn't take out the allegiance part. So let's go ahead and look at what allegiance is. In the highly suspicious definitions from Google, we find Merriam-Webster stating that allegiance is, well, these are synonyms. This is really a definition, but anyway, uh, fidelity, allegiance, fealty, loyalty, devotion, piety mean faithfulness to something to which one is bound by pledge or duty. Now, I don't know why you would need to promise to be faithful to the Constitution and also allegiance and also swear your allegiance. That seems a little bit, uh, I, I imagine those two, two things are in fact separate because otherwise they wouldn't have been, I don't know why they would make something redundant in the oath of enlistment. Anyway, loyalty and support for a ruler, country, group, or belief. Soldiers have to swear allegiance to the crown slash the king. Many, many American schools, blah, blah, blah. I know what they're going to say. They're going to say in most American schools, you have to swear allegiance to the flag is ridiculous if you can imagine that swearing allegiance to a flag allegiance is loyalty or faithfulness i would probably say it's more along the lines of loyalty but again they don't really want to directly state what allegiance really is especially to a person or cause allegiance refer usually refers to a loyalty that is considered extremely important yeah. these are the definitions we have to work with today in the next set of hits, it states that members of the state parliament still often vote along ethnic lines or owe their first allegiance to their entity, occasionally leading to blockage. I don't know how you can have a first allegiance. You kind of have you can only have really have allegiance to one thing. Your allegiance is your support for and loyalty to a particular group, person, or belief. My allegiance is to Kendall and his. Allegiance is a duty of fidelity said to be owed or freely committed by the people, subjects, or citizens of their state or sovereign. And, of course, according to these definitions, you could, in fact, have more than one allegiance. But considering that the Constitution states that it is the supreme law of the land, when it comes to the land, you cannot have more than one allegiance. If you swear allegiance to the Constitution, it specifically directs you that you can only have allegiance to it because it claims itself as being the supreme law of the land. That's when it comes to the land. Now, why is it always important that we look into these word games? Well, let's go ahead and look at the practical consequences of not upholding someone's oath of enlistment. Dereliction of duty is a specific, specific offense under United States Code Title 10, Section 892, Article 92, and applies to all branches of the U.S. military. Now, here's the interesting part. Dereliction of duty is not an offense that is only stated under the United States Code Title 10, blah, blah, blah. But the way that they insinuate it here, it's like it is only derived from that, but it's not. Dereliction of duty is a concept that goes back many, basically centuries. Anyway, a service member who is derelict has willfully refused to perform his duties or has incapacitated himself in such a way that he cannot perform his duties. Notice, one of those duties in the Oath of Enlistment is allegiance to the Constitution. It is not allegiance to the government. It is not allegiance to the armed forces. It is not allegiance to the nation. It is allegiance to the document. And it's not allegiance to the flag either. Dereliction of duty means that person willfully or negligent, negligently failed to perform his or her duties or perform them in a culpably inefficient manner. It's intentional. Something that you have to do because it is part of your job or something that you feel is the right thing. That's nonsense. Dereliction of duty is a person's purposeful or accidental failure to perform an obligation without a valid excuse. So that's the awful definition from Cornell. Dereliction is a serious offense. Know what it is. The Collins Concise Dictionary defines dereliction as conscious or willful neglect especially in the case of duty. 
Again, the oath of enlistment charges duty. It charges allegiance to the Constitution. People that do not uphold their oaths of enlistment are in dereliction of duty. Because you swear an oath to the Constitution that is willfully and freely taken. Which means if you do not carry out the charges of your oath, then you are willfully in dereliction of duty. Well, you're in dereliction of duty because you're willfully doing it. So, in according to Justia, uh, dereliction of duty, willfully or negligently failing to perform assigned duties or performing them in a culpably inefficient manner, and so on and so forth. And then word reference, that's a translation uh, website. Now, naturally, you have to take into account that these definitions are all written by brain dead professors basically and that's the reason why they're so screwy and they constantly trying to mess with perception and insinuate propaganda into their their uh, definitions which gets really tiresome because google only ever shows their work and not those of competent individuals so let's go ahead and look into the derivation of authority of many of our so-called officials. Starting with the State Department, notor notarial and authentication services of U.S. consular, whatever. How do you get a document notarized overseas? How do the notarial functions of U.S. notarizing officers differ from a U.S. notary public? Now, I can absolutely attest that that is not the case now because currently the consulates can only do three things and notarizing stuff is not one of them. So here, where I am, I have to go and get a notary from, from where I'm residing and get them to do it even though they're not even U.S. authorities officially. It's just stupid. So, if you Google where does the U.S. notary derive authority, it goes through a lot of effort not to state where they actually derive their authority. It states, notaries are appointed by a government authority, that's big, such as a court governor, county commissioner, or lieutenant governor, or by a regulating body, blah, blah, blah. Most U.S. states and jurisdictions only authorize commissioned notaries public or other notarial officers recognized under state law. Yeah. Not constitutional law, mind you. State law. And then there's the notary uh, uh, thing from the US, uh, Mexico government. <clears throat> Alleged Mexican government, which is another corporation. Uh, incorporated under the United Nations Charter and all that nonsense. Commissioner for Oaths. This is from Canada. The Evidence Act is the law from which you derive your authority as a commissioner for oaths it is important they become familiar with blah 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 so that is the government of northwest territories for canada the irs is organized to carry out the responsibilities of the secretary of the treasury under section 7801 of the internal revenue code so there they derive their authority from the internal revenue code the secretary has full authority. Yeah, full authority. That sounds so official and so impressive because they have full authority, not partial authority, full authority, to administer and enforce the internal revenue laws. Again, they're making, well, not again, but here they're making a distinction of laws, plural. Not the law, but laws, plural. And has the power to create an agency to enforce these laws. Has the power to create an agency to enforce these laws. What power? Where do they derive their power from? The Internal Revenue Code is the only thing stipulated here as their derivation of power. Pretty amazing. Then, let's move on to the Department of Health and Human Services. That lovely entity that likes to rule over us with all sorts of mandates recently. 
well, not recently, since I guess their inception. It's just become more obvious recently. Disclaimer. This web page is intended to provide general information. Notice that general information. That's like the person saying, oh, this is just for entertainment purposes. <laughs> About the HHS secretary's legal authorities, legal authorities, you know, love that word in there, <sighs> to prepare for and respond to public health and medical emergencies and is not intended to provide specific legal advice or guidance. This information does not provide an exhaustive list of the HHS secretary's legal authorities to prepare for and respond to public health and medical emergencies. Individuals should always seek the advice of an attorney. Notice that there. Should always seek. Quite stupid. That, that, in, that right there is giving legal advice in a way that they could state that they aren't technically giving legal advice because it states should always seek the advice of an attorney without any questions they may have regarding the legal matter. Oh, wait, with any questions, yeah. What, what nonsense. The HHS secretary's legal authority, again, it is not stating where it derives its, quote, legal authority to take action to prepare for and respond to public health and medical emergencies under several statutes. Okay, so there it does state that vaguely it derives its authority from several statutes, primarily including the Public Health Service PHS Act. So there they're stating an act, Food Fe Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, and the Social Security Act. Various other legal authorities may also authorize the HHS secretary to respond to public health and medical emergencies. Now, I imagine those various other legal authorities are the UN, non-governmental organizations, associations, and all of the other juridic entities that seem to rule over us without question. In general, the legal authority of the HHS secretary for each of the following circumstances is, and of course, naturally, none of this respects the sovereignty of human beings. Notice that. All of this stuff is vague, but it clearly is coming from the juridic lens, meaning corporations, institutions, entities that are, quote, non-human. The FDIC was created by the Banking Act of 1933, enacted during the Great Depression to restore trust in the American banking system. And here they're trying to add some explanation. That is a veiled threat, basically stating that if the FDIC doesn't ar isn't around, then we're going to have another Great Depression. Yeah, well, the FDIC is around, and I think a lot of people would say this situation is probably, possibly in many ways, worse than the Great Depression that we're currently in, being made by all these juridic entities because they, well, anyway, we can get into that motives and the motives in different videos. Reading further, the FDIC receives no congressional appropriations, allegedly, for, according to them, anyway. It is funded by premiums that banks and savings associations pay for deposit insurance coverage. To accomplish this mission, the FDIC ensures deposits, examines, and supervises financial institutions for safety, soundness, and consumer protection. So here they're essentially stating that they're an unelected body, regulatory body, that has complete independence from the alleged U.S. government that we're all supposed to recognize as a legitimate entity of governance or regulation. These people can do literally whatever the hell they want, and nobody can do anything about it because they, quote, don't receive any congressional appropriations. Isn't that nice? The FDIC is an independent agency created by the U.S. Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. Now, I don't know about you, but I have zero confidence in an independent agency, which is just about what we all have. All of these are independent agencies, actually. They're all independent. They just do whatever they want. The FDIC and the banking industry perspective and outlook under authority derived from the De Federal Deposit Insurance Act. Okay, so now we get an act. And the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, Dodd-Frank. So there, all of these basically, other than the IRS, claim their authority from acts. 
the only one on this list of agencies and departments that I looked up, the only one that claims authority from the Constitution is the Transportation Department. That is not an accident. That is acting based off of the part in the Constitution that states it's the supreme law of the land, which means the Department of Transportation operating on the physical land has to at least pretend like they derive their authority from the Constitution. Here, under Ballotpedia, it states the Transportation Department was formed by President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1966. That's a fraudulent president, of course. Like the U.S. Department of Commerce, the Transportation Department had its roots based on the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Let's go ahead and look at that. But first, we should note <clears throat> that apparently... The company, Ferrovial, was chosen by the Texas Department of Transportation to operate on projects of highway expansion. First of all, Ferrovial is a company that works with constructing and operating railways. And when you look up, is Ferrovial a juridic entity, you get LEI and SWIFT code of Ferrovial SA Spain. The legal entity identifier, that tells you it's a juridic entity, mind you. Code of Ferrovial SA is blah, blah, blah. The legal form of the company is F5RDO and is subject to the jurisdiction of ES law. Now notice that it states it's, it is subject to the jurisdiction of ES law, not the U.S. Constitution. Ferrovial determination the member state of origin identifier legal identity. Ferrovial SA X issuer of shares admitted to trading. Ferrovial SA previously Grupo Ferrovial is a Spanish multinational company that operates in the infrastructure of blah, blah, blah. Now, I can guarantee you that if they are stating that they are subject to the jurisdiction of Spanish law, then there is no possible way that, they, that this juridic entity ever swore an oath to up support to, to anything with the Constitution of the United States. And yes, yet they have been selected to carry out operations allegedly derived from a clause in the Constitution by the so-called Department of Transportation of Texas. Now, either the Department of Transportation of Texas is acting in treason to the U.S. Constitution, or the Texas Department of Transportation has absolutely no authority to do what they're doing, and they're an enemy of the Constitution. But either way, selecting a juridic entity that is subject to the jurisdiction of Spain to operate on highways in the United States, that is inviting foreign influence. Now, according to that clause that they allegedly derive their authority from, that is under Section 8 of, I don't remember which article it was, Either way, it states that <clears throat> to regulate commerce with four nations and among several states and with the Indian tribes, that the Congress, notice it states the Congress, not the Department of Transportation and not the President and nobody else, states the Congress, that's a legitimate Congress, shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States and that they have the charge to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among several states and with the Indian tribes. The Department of Transportation is acting under the color of law. They are pretending to have legitimate authority and they are selling out every U.S. citizen, juridic or otherwise, to foreign interests.
And then we get the other notion is that let's go ahead and, and continue with the pretend game and let's pretend that these people and these druidic entities and the people that operate on behalf of these druidic entities are in fact operating under legitimate authority with constitution. Well, then let's go ahead and look at the will or purpose of the constitution. It states under the preamble, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States. There, in the preamble, it states, the will of the constitution is to ensure domestic tranquility. So one way or another, all of these entities that are constantly causing conflict and warmongering and causing disorder among the people of the United States, they are in direct violation of the will of the Constitution. They are either traitors or they're enemies. And one way or the other, they have to be removed because they are going against the one part that it states in the Constitution that states ensure domestic tranquility we certainly do not have domestic tranquility nor have we had for a long time and it's because of these people that represent these juridic entities and these juridic entities that are parading around as people now in the levantine adventure we get a good context that describes the situation that us human public people face today versus the juridic entities and how we can imagine that we are essentially ruled over by a juridic public and that being part of the human public is tantamount to the a secondary level of citizenship, they being the primary level of citizenship. In the Levitite Adventure, The Travels and Missions of Chevalier Darbu, 1653 to 1697 by Warren H. Lewis, we get an idea. It states, by far the most onerous burden on a consul was the provision of gifts to the local Turkish authorities, or in other words, payment of blackmail to be freed from extortion and oppression. For if they were ordinary gifts, that is, routine presents sanctioned by prescription, the money came out of the consul's pocket, and only the extraordinary ones were paid out of the chest of the nation. These presents, or avanis, as they were called, had become the custom since the time of that thrifty monarch, Sultan Morad III, 1574 to 1595, who, so far from paying his provisional officials, had adopted the system of selling posts by auction and letting the successful bidder make what he could out of his bargain. Prices ran high and the appointments were sold for one year only and the purchase had to exercise considerable ingenuity if he was to emerge from his tenure of office with a profit. The Pashalik of Cairo, for instance, often sold for uh, 100,000 livres, and many speculators were ruined by buying it. The Frank merchants were the Pasha's wealthiest available victims, and hence the Avani. Any pretext served for its imposition, which could be invented by the governor, or more usually by his Greek secretary, who hated Roman Catholics more than he did Mohammedans. To repair a leaking chapel roof without permission meant an avani. To strike a Muslim, no matter what the prov provocation, to fail to comply with any of the innumerable government edicts, to neglect to illuminate your house for a Turkish victory, there is never any lack of excuse for the infliction of an avani. And sometimes not even an excuse was offered. In Egypt, for instance, far from Constantinople, and with a population testing the infidel with a frenzy unknown anywhere elsewhere in the empire, the Pasha in 1653 demanded and got a large Avani from the French merely on the ground of their obvious prosperity. But fortunately, the payment of an Avani, like all other payments in the Levant, was a subject for bargaining. The Pasha, who demanded a thousand piastres to quash proceedings against a young fool who had snatched a kiss from the Turkish woman, hoped to give 500, and after a week of daily coffee and compliments would probably settle for 350. If, however, no settlement could be arrived at, the consul could uh, 
appeal to the Grand Vizier through the ambassador, but almost any Avani was better than an appeal, which was a ruinous business even if successful. Whilst all the Frank nations suffered from Avanis, the French, thanks to their lack of organization, were much harder hit by them than the English and the Dutch. The English Levant Company, for instance, maintained a sinking fund for the payment of Avanis by means of a 1% tax on the value of all cargoes exported to Levant. But the French never paid an Avani until the last possible moment and when forced to do so, generally had to borrow the money at an exorbitant rate of interest offered from the very official who had inflicted the Avani. Or if the nation refused to borrow, the expedients adopted to raise the money were nearly always disastrous, as for example, a tax on all coin found in the cargo of the next outward bound ship. And as cash often formed the sole cargo of an outward bounder, this tax left its captain with insufficient funds to secure a full lading for the homeward run. And the French, in spite of their penny-wise policy over Avanese on the whole, made less money than their English and their Dutch rivals. But Avanese were not entirely responsible for this. As late as 1686, Louis XIV was complaining of the disorder prevalent in his shells, manifested by the fact that French Levant merchants indulged in cutthroat buying against each other, whereas their rivals formed buyer rings. Worse still, the same mistake was made in selling French products so far from any attempt being made to hold up the market. Each Frenchman was bent on underselling his compatriots, or in other words, dumping. The root of the trouble was that French trade was organized on quite a different basis from that of the English and the Dutch, both of whom concentrated on the major shells and whose business there was in the hands of a small number of substantial merchants, whilst the French, though not neglecting the bigger centers, had a large number of small traders in many little towns and villages who could live only by a policy of small profits and quick returns. Another source of anxiety to a consul was the behavior of his nation, which always contained a good many dubious characters, La Haye, French ambassador to the port, but the situation plainly to Colbert, Colbert in 1665. The disorders of the shells are not entirely the work of the Turks or the Jews but very often owing to the bad behavior of the resident French merchants. True, one finds honest Frenchmen in the shells, but also a large number of rogues and evil livers who, having been forced to crime or bankruptcy to abandon their country and hide in Levant, are most usually the cause of disorder and avanese. It will be my first care to clean the shells of this vermin and prevent any more of it from introducing itself in the future. But it was not until 1685 that an official stationed at Marseille had the responsibility of seeing, seeing that no Frenchman embarked for the Levant without a certifi certificate of good character from the Chamber of Commerce and an attestation that he had never been a bankrupt. Now, a lot of this stuff we experience today. And we especially experience the Avanis, which we today call taxes, fees, and other such names. And interestingly, the fear about not paying taxes, so-called, which are really simply extorted fees that we pay to avoid being imprisoned or otherwise abused, as the Avanis were leveraged, well, the fear behind paying those Avanis that we all have to pay stems directly from the tale that is purely fictional in most regards of Al Capone who looks like a banker or a stage actor dressed as a banker and naturally he was from Sardinia Corsica no that was Napoleon that came from Corsica but same difference both equally fictional entities anyway if you have enjoyed this content, please like this video, share it, subscribe to my channels. Stay tuned, there will be more. And also, if you so choose, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. And there are free books available at the link. Thank you.